welcome back to the um, Wednesday lecture series, uh, Experiments and Exploration in Contemporary Bay Area Art and Media Art. Um, we're uh, next week, next Wednesday on April 18th, we have a Porpentine Charity Heartscape, who is a writer, game designer, and dead swamp mil milf in Oakland. Her work includes xenofem, sci fantasy, cursed video games, and globe spanning sentient slime molds. She's a game, uh, a game designer, and she's going to be talking about the alt alternative game cultures uh, and how her work fits into that. So that's next week. And our final uh, lecture uh, the following week after um, is, and, and will end on an appropriately political note, um, is, we'll, we'll have Malkia Cyril, who is the founder and executive director of the Oakland Center for Media Justice. She's a co-founder of the Media Action Grassroots Network, and she'll be speaking about media justice and uh, the movement for digital rights and freedom. And she's an extraordinary speaker and activist and well worth coming to hear. This week, we've been exploring some questions about experimental art and race. In what ways does aesthetic experimentation mean different things across different cultures, races, and ethnicities? On Monday, uh, when the class meets on its own, we spoke about improvisation as an African-American form of art practice that opens on to the possibility for a broad range of exploration and and creativity. We honored the passing of Cecil Taylor, one of the great African-American improvisers of the 20th century, whose work in uh, music, dance, and poetry really transformed our ideas of what uh, improvisation as an art is. We also explored the idea of Afrofuturism as a form of thinking about the black experience in history and the ways in which it offers new forms for thinking about temporality, narrative, and uh, tradition. Um, and today, to continue some this discussion, uh, we have with us the Black Aesthetic, which is an Oakland-based creative organization whose mission is to curate and assemble both a collective and individualized understanding of black visual culture. They pose the question, what is the black aesthetic sensibility and what does it look like to you? In their manifesto, they write, by working with artists, writers, filmmakers, and designers, we cultivate work that asks our audience to consider the relationship to black art. We are invested in developing a community who will participate and engage with our mission. When you support the black aesthetic, you are actively supporting a network of black artists. Through film screenings, publications, and product development, they want to add to a growing collection of artistic visions that are grounded in place, body, lived experience, and are responsive to its respective environment." Unquote. As a collective of black artists and thinkers based in the quickly gentrifying city of Oakland, they've been responding to the housing crisis and declining black population by creating events that respond with increasing urgency to preserve the local legacy of black culture, to hold space, to explore questions of belonging through, acts, through the arts by organizing and sponsoring exhibits, uh, publications of books, magazines, and making podcasts and films. Their events attract large audiences like we have here today. And, um, uh, uh, and they create a much needed embodied context for discussion, celebration, and experimentation that is at once aesthetic and deeply political. I'm very excited that we're able to be a part of one of their events this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming the Black Aesthetic Collective. Hello. All right. 
Hi. All right. Hello. All right. So um, I'll start off with the introduction, another introduction of the Black Aesthetic. Um, we thank you for that wonderful introduction you gave. Um, so my name is Jamal Batts, a member of the Black Aesthetic. And for us, the Black Aesthetic is, to, is TBA, meaning to be announced, to be assessed, and to be actualized. Thus, the Black Aesthetic is a position of the yet to be announced. We eschew continuity in favor of exploration. In an interview for Film Quarterly, Michael Gillespie says, quote, I'm interested in the rendering of Blackness or how Black visual and expressive culture stages race, not just as impermeable fact, but as multidimensional, multidimensional and multidiscursive. The Black aesthetic is not interested in the already expressed face of the race, but on the multi, but on the multidimensional dimensional visual and expressive culture of blackness. This objective is not to clarify a theme as, as such. Instead, we are unambiguously creating a space where various distinct and dissonant black artistic expressions can live. Our most consistent venture thus far has been an Oakland-based biannual eight-week film screening series featuring the works of indie, experimental, unknown, or to our mind, underappreciated black filmmakers. These screenings are followed by in-depth exchange, often with the filmmaker, about the ways in which the themes of the films in their very temporalities intersect with the current proliferation of black aesthetics and the structural forces that interdict black life. As member Layla Weifwe has recently noted, the film screening is not a novel idea, but as a collective, the black aesthetic distinguishes, distinguishes itself by documenting this experience through photography and the publication of varied visual, poetic, biographic, and scholarly responses to the film screened. The group has also curated one-off screenings and discussions at cultural and academic institutions, as well as collaborated with visual artists. Being that the group considers itself to be announced, the Black aesthetic acts as a container for its members' collective, collaborative aesthetic desires, experimenting with different Oakland environs while refusing to land on a place, a genre, a mode of curation that would define its entangled object of study, Blackness. The Black aesthetic's members are um, Jamal Batts, myself, Ryan Austin Dennis, who's with us this evening, Ramalaka Imhotep, who had a previously, previously scheduled event out of state, so couldn't, unfortunately couldn't be with us this evening, um, and Layla Weifwe, who's with us this evening as well. Um, to give a preview of the work we do as a collective, we have prepared presentations related to the works we've published across two Black aesthetic books. All right, so this is my piece, um, Queer Takes on Another Girl from the first Black Aesthetic publication, excerpts from the three sections. Um, it's a response to um, the film, uh, uh, Just Another Girl on the IRT. All right. Take one, Washington, D.C., 2003. First, a story about blackness, desire, and cars. I met him on the internet when I was a junior in college. He said he worked in some security field, but wouldn't give me his job title. After some convincing by me, he agreed to meet at a, star, at a Starbucks. I was 20 and still a bit ignorant. He was tall, dark skinned, with a slim muscular build. He was one of the harder masculine types in Richmond, Virginia, the only kind of men I, I used to like. Once, in excitement, I ran across the wide streets of Richmond to meet him. He told me men my height shouldn't run. I quickly tempered my excitement. My father was 48 years old when I was born, shook Martin Luther King Jr.'s hand, and participated in the sit-ins. When I was in middle school, I approached him in tears because my classmates were calling me gay. He told me to stop bending my wrist. I listened. Washington, D.C.'s black gay pride was an escape from those I or my body had to answer to. I remember bringing my tightest clothes in the brightest colors. When I got a call from the boy from Richmond, I was excited to hear he was in, he was in D.C. too, but I was a little frightened about his reaction if he saw me in such tight jeans. We agreed to see each other at the club that night. That night, I was full, as, full of excitement. I still remember what I was wearing, a tight black t-shirt with pink lettering. It said something in Spanish. All I remember is the word leche. I, I paired it with some matching black and pink Converse brand sneakers and some cheap pink, sun, some peak, 
some pink tinted sunglasses I'd bought earlier that day from a kiosk in the mall. That night, I was going to a party, basically blind, in order to wear these cute, these cute sunglasses in a dark club and dance with the boy I wanted. I was 20 years old, so I drank as much liquor as I could handle before I left the hotel. One of my best friends and I were in the lobby, drunk, looking for someone to drive us to the club before our older friends had fallen because our older friends had fallen asleep. While downstairs, a group of older African Americans donning kente cloth stopped us and asked if either one of us knew the name of the man who organized the March on Washington. Somehow, in my intoxicated state, I quickly answered Bayard Rustin, but he was not given the recognition because he was gay. The woman who asked the question said to her friends, I knew he would know. As edgy as I think I look, the nerd always, the, the nerd somehow always shows. My friend and I piled into a compact car full of kind stranger, strangers. It was packed so tight I had to sit on the lap of a man I did not know and could hardly see. I had this intense anticipation to get to the club and see the boy from Richmond. The music in the car was loud, but the police sirens were even louder. The driver of our small car pulled over. Three other police vehicles showed up and surrounded us while their sirens blared and, red, and bright red, white, and blue lights flashed. Over a loudspeaker, a police officer told us all to put our hands up. For a second, all of the black gay men, all of the black men in the car thought we might die. That night, the officer gave the driver of the vehicle a citation and we drove back to the hotel. We never made it to the club. I didn't get to see the boy from Richmond. In fact, I never saw him again. I, I always thought he was a cop. Take two, you got a fast car, I want a ticket to anywhere. Um, and a quote from LL Cool J's back seat, back seat of my Jeep, let's swing an episode. The thing about black cult film classic, Just Another Girl from the IRT, that most often seems to capture the attention of viewers is lead character Chantel's love of boys with Jeeps. I recently searched for the film on Twitter and people can't get over the hilarity of how Chantel's tough Brooklyn girl exterior consistently falls to the whims of boys sitting on chrome. I can remember this early 1990s love of Jeeps. My lower middle class family spent a month picking out the perfect Jeep Grand Cherokee only to have it stolen directly in front of church during Bible study the night it was purchased. I can also understand, I can also understand the desire for a man with a, with a reliable car in a city where the rent continues to rise, whether it's Brooklyn or the Bay Area. Some of us smile at boys with Jeeps, and some of us tap like on every tech bro's profile we see on Tinder, even if we never like, even, even if they never like back. We all thirst for security. Just another big just Another Girl begins in some version of Brooklyn, New York, 1993, with, spoiler alert, Chantel's just-delivered baby being disposed of at her request in a black trash bag. The baby will soon be rescued. The blue-lit tenement that backgrounds the scene, the ambulance that basically refuses to visit Chantel, and the baby crying in a trash bag foreground the city's disinvestment in black futures and in hindsight foreshadows the coming of gentrification. Could it be said that the film also represents the making of black sexual desire under these circumstances? The next scene is a flashback to simpler times. We find Chantel at a subway station, cruising a cute, dark brown boy, black boy with flawless skin and a short, curly, processed, boxed haircut. His name is Jerry. He says he's a model. Chantel plays him. Like Tom and Jerry, she says, until he reve reveals that he has a car. Well, how you doing? She replies with a charming, high fin smile, extending her hand. My name is Chantel. There's this short close-up of Chantel's red fingernails inserting a token into the subway terminal to get to the train that will take her to her next destination, her part-time job. The shot signals an erotic in intensity coursing through the entire film. Chantel doesn't just enter subway stations for economic efficiency. She's interested in the potential of the unknown destination. Whether Chantel is, is paying for the train or a chance to flirt with, the, with models will always be questionable. Her desires always seem to waver undecidedly between a need for sustenance and an environment that continue, continually signals its disinterest in where she might land and another need to be anywhere better than here and now. 
Her, her world's lack of concern for her well-being leads her to choose or subjects her to a fugitive, indecipherable, and sometimes frustrating for the viewer movement through the city. The film's title, in its reference to the IRT, aka the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, marks Chantel's desire for mobility, a mobility given many names throughout the film, ranging from the more immediate Jeep to the fut futural college and many points in between. But in naming her just another girl on a train in New York, Harris half-jokingly gestures to Chantel's, quote, fungibility. Chantel is undoubtedly unlike any other girl. Through actress Ariane A. Johnson and Harris's creativity, Chantel bears a personality, audacity, vibrant style, and overall way of moving through the world, slicing through space with the movement of her hands, for instance, that make her an unparalleled individual. But it must also be remembered that Chantel, as a character, is a production, a cipher through which audiences project their understandings of black urban teenage women or come to, quote, learn about them. Take three, you can't get pregnant. In the final act of Just Another Girl, Chantel becomes pregnant by a boy with a Jeep. This may be read as the director's after-school television special public service announcement warning black women about the dangers of consumerism. In the end, Chantel wraps up the film, uh, in the end, Harris wraps up the film with Chantel pleased with her future. It's not as idyllic as she'd hoped, a baby in community college instead of a four-year institution, parties with boys, and eventually med school. But she's happy to be surviving through it all. While Harris can be commended for asking her audience to honor the life of a working class black woman whose situation would often get her labeled, quote, just another statistic, I want to consider not only where Chantel ends up, but her journey there. In what seems to be a teenage take on the classic scene of black women's talk in a living room from Spike Lee's earlier Jungle Fever, 1991, Chantel, her best friend Natet, and their friend Lavonica commence to discussing sex and the ever looming threat of pregnancy. Natet reveals she has been Natet reveals she has been taking her sister's birth control pills just in case she finds the quote real man she hopes to meet at Lavonica's coming birthday party. Chantel responds, What? Natet, what did I tell you about that? Yo, you supposed to have your own prescription for that. Watch, you're going to get sick. Natet. No, I'm not going to get sick. I'm going to be ready for Saturday night. Lavonica, what are you crazy? What's the problem with rubbers? What's so hard about that? Natet, most guys don't like using them. I don't even like the way it feels. Chantel, mm-hmm, word. Lavonica, I don't know with AIDS. Go I don't know with AIDS going around. Natet, yeah, but none of our friends use rubbers, and nobody likes the way it feels. Lavonica, yo, don't you care if you die? Natet. Look, I'm going to die sooner or later, and before I die, I want to know what it's like to feel a real man inside of me, not some old piece of plastic. Besides, the only way you can get it is if you gay or an intravenous drug user. So chill, because I ain't fucking around with nobody like that. Lavonica, I don't know. You don't know where he's been. Chantel, mm-hmm, that's right. Natet. Lavonica, chill. You watching too much 2020 and reading and reading too much Inquire, Inquirer. You can't be afraid of everything. In this conversation, in this conversation, Natet is wrong about much. Pa Past trafficking and a homophobia also present in the reminiscent scene from Lee's Jungle Fever, Natet goes on to claim that, quote, if you take a bottle of soda and you shake it up and you shoot it up your pussy, then you won't get pregnant, end quote. I'm more interested in thinking about Natet's comment, comments on condom use than clarifying the relative truth or false, falsity of her many claims about sex and safety. In certain queer theoretical circles, sexual risk has recently been parsed for its radical potential. Gay men's barebacking, raw sex, and bug chasing, pers purposeful HIV transmission between consenting serodiscordant serial partners is read by scholars to be a potentially radical move, rejecting the normalizing mandates of homonormativity, including safe sex and, monogam and monogamous same-sex marriage that seek recognition from a state that thrives on controlling sexual 
freedoms. Sex that precludes condoms, according to Tim Dean in Unlimited Intimacy, Reflections on the Subculture of Barebacking, provides new ways of thinking kinship through the transmission of gay and queer culture and the sharing of semen. Others, including scholar David Halperin, argued that there is nothing to support Dean's, Dean's claim that erotic risk among gay men has become organized and deliberate, not just accidental. Instead, Halpern argues that safe sex as we know it was a gay grassroots innovation. Over time, according to Halpern, through sexual experimentation, gay men have created, created workable, because they are con condomless, practices for reducing the transmission of HIV. Again, for the purposes of this piece, I'm not interested in whether Natet or Dean and Halpern, two white male queer theorists, are correct. Rather, I want to focus on the thing that all three agree on, that condom usage as a constant sexual practice is unenjoyable and untenable. I focus on this coincidence because I wonder what it would mean to extend the frame of radicality or experimentation to the viewing of black women's sexuality. Sexual risk as a public health debate and media spectacle has certainly affected the lives of all black people. But maybe sexual risk doesn't register as a useful agental practice for black women because structurally their lives are given to so much risk in general. In Just Another Girl, this is represented through Chantel's experiences with street harassment men touching and grabbing her without consent, the disciplinary mechanisms of a school that, despite her high GPA, demands she act, quote, more like a lady, a federal agency that makes it illegal to discuss abortion as an, as an option, and of course, blackness and poverty. Halpern limits his comments on sexual experimentation to white gay men because their experiments have led to results. The reduction of HIV transmission um, transmissions which are still relatively high among black gay men. This is a troubling this is a troubling move for me because it limits the ability to think of black queer folks as their own sex scientists, participants in discoveries that Halpern claims only white queers benefit from. I know that I no, never personally plan to have sex without a condom, but truth be told, I've never been any good at, good at planning. The creative and manageable, and manageable ways that I've come to think harm reduction for myself pre and post prep fluctuate. I know many black gay men would agree. As far as Chantel and her friends are concerned, I know I don't and cannot feel what they feel, but I do feel with their ambivalent and sometimes confused desires when it comes to sexual pleasure. I feel with their compulsion to try new things, even if I think it may end disastrously. I've made mistakes before. I also know that naming mistakes and disasters, especially as they apply to black people, is a highly subjective process. I would like to pro propose that we consider feeling with as a mode of thinking how black people navigate risk. This may give us a way to think what kinship might look like past identity. This might lead to a way of naming a praxis, a praxis that's already in practice. The unmentioned and too often unmentionable ways that black cis and trans men and women find possibly similar but not equal ways of operating through sex in an anti-black world that puts death in front of your face every day. Uh, anyway, so I am a, I'm an artist and filmmaker, uh, and the piece that I'm going to do for you today is the piece I wrote for the second publication, which we just released about a month ago. Uh, it's called The Dialectics of Black Space, but because I, I work in video and image making, I like to deconstruct my readings and into lecture performances, so that's what we'll have today. Hopefully sound is working. Okay. What is black space? What is black space when it is limitless and bodiless? What is black space when interrupted by non-black spatial matter? First, forget space as a somatic experience. Forget space as having clearly delineated borders and boundaries. Forget space as something we enter and exit. 
Black space is not an immutable structure. In the wake of authenticity warfare, where black space is threatened by white consumption and reproduction, a presentation, a representation of blackness in any space is subject to scrutiny. Because our black spaces are often owned by or contained within some white infrastructure, even the blackest imagery can become apocryphal, an othered sleight of hand. Can we disambiguate the enigma of blackness through presentations of signs, symbols, invariable black imagery? Arthur Jaffa says, the central conundrum for black being is that who we are ontolog ontologically is bound up with horror. Spiraling into dialectics of ownership becomes a conundrum and a horror. Do black people own black visual culture? Have black people ever owned blackness? The conundrum, of course, being that there is no right answer.
fanfares of the Olympic opening comes the most amazing performance by America's Black Street, Jesse Owens, in the 100 meters. The world's most superb runner makes the others look as if they're walking, as he wins the final and equals the world's record time. This and his later victories are long doubt may well be the athletic performances of the century. And now the final struggle is on in the women's javelin throw. But black has historically been its own competitor. Competing to perform in beauty and horror. Competing to perform for the horror of whiteness. There is a horror in the ever lingering thought that black images have been and still are being produced by non-Black people. The culture is a self-reflexive, transgenerational influence that redefines Blackness through its reproduction of images that are authored and claimed by both Black and non-Black makers. What is Black space? Black space is supposed to be a place of comfort a home, a shelter preserving black intimacy, a place where our relationships to one another's blackness is bound. But as blackness shifts with time and amendment to language, so will the thing that houses it. Can you tell me what blackness sounds like? How loud is it? How quiet is it? Does blackness have the ability to abstain from sound? Can blackness simulate silence? Think about, for just a moment, the silence of darkness. Think about what that silence feels like. Blackness knows silence. There's nothing more silent than darkness. Nothing produces vibrato like darkness. Darkness occupies both inside and outside spaces, spaces that are both tactile and psychological. Spaces serve contradictory feelings of intimacy and isolation, depending on whether your position as an insider or an outsider. A friend once told me that to be wise is to be able to hold space for contradiction. I would argue the same applies to blackness. In understanding blackness in the imagined space that blackness provides and claims, an insider can easily become an outsider as an outsider through active engagement and consumption can become an insider. When it comes to matters of presenting concepts of blackness, I found that the outsider is often looking for simplification in place of nuance. And what they discover is a smoke screen. Imagine for a moment sitting in a movie theater, which we are. A space that capitalizes on darkness a space which historically does not and cannot function without the absence of light. In the absence of light, physical attributes are even less discernible. Our colors mute and blend. The bumps and curves in our figures blur. And all that's left is our breath, movement, and the tension that floats in the negative spaces our bodies can't fill. In darkness, it's hard to distinguish your pain from mine. 
at a time where the ownership of blackness is at stake. Is there and can there be such a thing as black space? A space that is meant for only black identified bodies to congregate? Who then are the trespassers? What space are we trying to recolonize? Is it one that is rightfully ours? And if so, how do we know when an image belongs to blackness? How do we know when space belongs to blackness? Does one ever? Does one ever? I like to think about black space as a place that comfortably operates between the celebration of black idioms and the subversion of black epithets. A place where any form of nigga is acceptable as an underpinning of black camaraderie. To have a black aesthetic, to be in conversation with the black aesthetic and the black aesthetic itself is an act of initiating and participating in that internal questioning and interrogation of blackness. Its existence is to consider the possibilities of black space by constructing it in real time and deconstructing it in printed matter. The answers will shift as much as the questions the answers attempt to serve until that matter decomposes with the English language. So whenever I'm given the option to be questioned about blackness and black space in a mostly non-black space, my response, But I have questions to pose to you. What is black? What is black space? What is a black aesthetic? What is black intimacy? What is black equity? Thank you. Here we go. Hello, my name is Ryan Austin Dennis. When I was thinking about reading for this event, I kept turning and circling over the ideas of perception and audience in relation to writing and then I started to think about blackness and performance and agency and blur, blur, blur. I was tired of my body holding the weight of history. I thought how each of the members of TBA would respond to the idea of presenting their thoughts and how pointless it was to show some unified line of thought. I believe that what connects us is the pursuit of pleasure and its delicious possibility as we work as a collective. Here I'll quote Arthur Jaffa, Black pleasure, not joy. What are its parameters? What are its primal sites? How does black popular culture or black culture in general address black pleasure? How does it generate black pleasure? So my offering it is a series of statements followed by a glorious low fidelity video of supreme black pleasure. Black Accelerationist Statements Thesis 1. If you are disabled you will not live. If you are able you will be caged and you will not live. Thesis 2. All black cultural production is void. Thesis 3. There isn't a black body. Thesis 4. The black family is a ready-made. Thesis 5. Before Duchamp, there was chattel. Before the urinal, there was nothing. Thesis 6. Doing things in the street is more powerful than art. Thesis 7. Do not romanticize the future. Thesis 8. Your ancestors dreamed of you. Thesis 9. Afrofuturists are technocrats, burn them. Thesis 10. In the future there will be nothing. Thesis 11. Violence is always legitimate in a state of war. Thesis 12. Black art is the only art.
It's a part real. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sam, you're going to be running around with the questions. Hi, thank you so much for your presentations and your knowledge. Um, I really appreciate the acknowledgement of queerness within all of the um, works that you've done. How do you address classism within um, your exploration of existing in blackness? specifically dealing with other black people, not just like the general norm of um, white supremacist Euro structures of classism, but how it translate into how we interact with one another within black. Um, you're asking this a broad question, right? Okay, you yeah. restate the question. So you're like, how do we deal with- How do you address classism as an individual within your black um, communities, within your individual communities of blackness? How do you address it and how do you work within it? For me, like, okay, I can answer that on a personal level, but I'm, I'm going to tangent out to it like a structural level, I guess. I think it's better for me to answer that in terms of, I'm trying to think, I want to answer that in terms of the black aesthetic and what we do to address that um, versus like what each of us do, because I don't know if we're going to come up with a like, great answer. I don't know what type of answer you want from that. But yeah, I'm concerned with it deeply, right? Because of like whatever institutional spaces we are in. So it's like I'm always making sure that it's not just like, you know, we don't want upper middle class black folks that are educated to come to things, right? I guess like that, because that, that creates a certain kind of, you know, air about things. We want to make sure there's a certain inclusivity around these conversations. So that brings, so what does that mean then? What, what kind of things that can we structure in? So it means the spaces in which we show films, I think. So like, you know, I think we've, we've, I think we've done a pretty good job of collaborating with people and then collaborating with spaces that allow from any community member to, to come in and feel welcome. That's from, from across the board. And also, this is a good question because I think we need to, I'm kind of curious to see like how everyone else in the group interprets that. But yeah. I think, hello. I think we're still figuring that out. I don't think we've been able to address it um, in, in the ways that we might want to. Um, and it's partially because of space and it's because of spaces in the Bay Area in particular. Um, and I think with our last season, season three, it was a bit of an experimentation with uh, who attended and um, the spaces that shifted the audiences because we did one in San Francisco and it was a predominantly white audience. Then we do some in Oakland and it's a mixed bag um, and we haven't quite figured out what the analytics of that like you want to speak to that no I think it's I, no I think it's I, I think it's a perfect question um, and I think that one of the things is um, has been about access. It's been about access to our events. There's been a lot, we have a lot of dialogue around how much it's gonna cost to get in, um, letting people in for free. Um, it's also a, a talk about how much we're gonna um, charge for somebody to get a publication. We're, we talk about how are we gonna pay the people who do contribute works to our, to our publications. So I think that this is an ongoing conversation. I also think it's it's interesting the type of like cultural capital that this being an experiment in the in the truest sense, the type of cultural capital that the group gets um, without its own input. It's not necessarily something that we we um, sought a, sought after, but. Um, I wonder about the types of space where spaces where the black aesthetic gains its its most uh, viability, where where people are, are most interested in it, and I think that um, it I think by experimenting with spaces, we're looking at how that can change over time. But it's always something that we're in dialogue about. Yeah, for sure, it's never perfect. That's for sure.
in spaces like this, typically when you're in spaces like this, you're dealing with college students. Like majority of the people in this room are probably in college, but um, not everyone in college is analyzing their lives at this state. You know what I mean? Like there are people who are in college who don't even try to analyze their lives at this state. So um, how do we create spaces that are both um, accessible and um, expansive beyond just, oh, you know how to critically think really well? Like, oh no, you actually just really like this film and you wanna be around other black people and you don't feel insecure because you can't critically think, you know? Yeah. Things like that. So I think the, the, the conversation of classism comes up a lot for me because I am pr a person who creates these spaces. Okay, yeah, that clarifies things, because, okay. Because definitely, I think that's kind of like the impetus for this project in a lot of ways, is like, we definitely want this, we don't want there to be this kind of like, um, this bar that you have to get to, to enter the conversation and the discussions. I don't know if you've ever been to one of our screenings before. Have you? I haven't gotten a okay. chance to be at so one of them. So I think if, I think if w the next opportunity you get to have a screening, I think that, I think that will b definitely kind of show you the type of culture that we're trying to create around intellectual discussions and around film and how we are very much like, we want it to be informal. There's, I don't think there's, a, there's not like a formality. I mean, I remember like we would um, have people like go in a circle and talk at one point. And then as we grew, we still make sure that there's a sense of robust discussion. People are allowed to like bring their full selves into the discussion. I don't, I've, I don't really feel like people can't do that. Um, in fact, uh, like we have people in the audience right, that have been to it that I, that I know bring their full selves into every discussion. And it, you know, it creates a really, you know, it, it creates, it's fun. It's more fun that way too, so. Yeah, and I, that is, yeah, I want to give something. I, I want there to be more questions, of course, yeah. but like, yeah. but I, I just think this is, you really touched on something immediately. So I think um, one of the things that um, I think is so wonderful about the black aesthetic is that film is this popular form that allows for so many people to have so many different entry points into a conversation and we've had like wonderful sometimes even like contentious conversations having to do with gender having to do with sexuality around film in particular and i think that though a number of us are um for one artist and myself a scholar who's here in the um, PhD program in African American African diaspora studies I think m many of us all of us are interested in certain what some would think of as theoretical questions having to do with blackness that we find important but I don't think that necessarily limits the scope of the conversations that we have yeah. hello so, so this is a question for Ryan Austin um, because of the one of the final lines in your piece about Afrofuturists, and I thought it was like pretty funny. Like I like I laughed at you know the idea of like <laughs> burning Afrofuturists, but I was curious if it wasn't a joke. Why, could, if, if you could elaborate on it, like why wouldn't Afrofuturists have a place in the Black aesthetic? I know I said it, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is my take on it. I think I've brought, I've had a. I remember way back it was like Jamal and Malika. I think we were all like we were all at a bar, and I was bringing up this concept of Afro uh, Afrofuturism and my understanding of it. Right. So this is my idea. I think in our kind of current tech society, right, I'm in like how data is being used in all these really odd ways. Right. Um, I feel like you know black bodies in general are kind of often surveillance, right? And so we have this world in which there's like all this data collection. And I'm often thinking about Afrofuturists, I, I don't, and I'm not like a per, I'm not some scholar on this stuff, but I'm really interested, I wouldn't know where are they thinking about the kind of underground railroad now, the kind of using hacking in our current present technology. And so I feel like there's this weird techno Credit utopia side of it that I'm just like maybe not interested in, and I just want to be provocative. I mean, they're called black accelerationist statements, so there's a there's a bit of provo a provoke provocation in that. Um, I feel like it's like what's the next? I'm often thinking, what's the next idea? What's after Afrofuturism? I think there's a current obsession that I don't under. I mean, I'm not interested in, but I think is deeply amazing for other people to tap into, right? And I'm I'm not a, not at all against that, but I'm just like what else is happening, you know, culturally. And I'm just like thinking about like, what would be, what would an art look like that 
you know, the after Afrofuturism or when we get those things that we want from Afrofuturism, that theoretical paradigm. And so I'm like, okay, like what's next? And also I think there's something kind of technocratic and you t like it's, it is, it, it just, for me it's just like, let's be careful of that. Um, let's be careful of this intersection of, you know, technology and black people when there's like a fungibility aspect that we have, right? So it's just like, we're already, and you know, when we're already kind of up, made into objects in a certain way, right? So what does it mean to be, what does it mean when an object and another object in, are like kind of intersecting, right? So, and like I'm not really invested in the idea of like the kind of human object thing that's going on. So, and that's like another conversation I could probably have, but hopefully that answers. Okay. Okay, so I was gonna ask, um, how's your identity been uh, redefined while doing the black aesthetic? And um, what inspired you to create the narratives of the black aesthetic? And like, is it a personal, is it personal experiences or based on experience of those around you? Yeah, can you repeat the last part of the? The last two parts. Oh, okay, yeah. so, um, so what inspires you to create the narratives of these um, black aesthetics, like these stories? Um, is it personal or based on experience of black people around you? Are you asking like, when you say create narratives, you mean like why we organize? Okay. Um, oh, we've had lots of conversations about this also. Um, the, well, Ryan Austin and Christian, who's right in the front with his feet on the stage, um, founded the Black Aesthetic and, uh, <laughs> and we all sort of met up in a bookstore one day and I think, you know, one thing that there's like a, a, a thirst for black community in Oakland. Um, I'm an Oakland native, born and raised. Christian is also an Oakland native, born and raised. And to see the black community like dissolve over time is something that is a, it's psychologically traumatic and something that, you know, we didn't realize or we're not realizing until we, you know, we, we sort of ran into each other, collided into each other under a state of like depression and thirst for, for each other and, and to be in spaces, in dark spaces together, sharing intimacy and watching. Um, and yeah, our, our identities have been really shaped by this. I would say that you know, upon joining the Black Aesthetic, I mean, I was in an MFA program at Mills and having conversations with people who look like me in, in the context of film and, and Black visual culture is something that is missing from, from the institution uh, and missing from most art spaces in the Bay Area. And so what we, why we do this is so that we like, just as even as individuals can learn from everybody that shows up. It's like, it's a generative dialogue, you know? So I don't know, if hopefully that answers. You wanna take it? I'm interested in the first part of the question about identity, yeah. um, because uh, about how it's potentially the experience of this has changed like a concept of identity, because I think that for one, it, it allows you to, um, at least for me, to expand these type of theoretical questions I have to, to, to other voices, to be able to know that I'm in conversation with other folks. And also, collective work is something that is, is new and, 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 and like wonderful, but also trying. Um, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's something like doing that, um, doing that and being, I don't, yeah, having, being, um, responsible for a project that's not just you um, is is important um, is is has been an important lesson for me um, in this process uh, so ni okay identity change and then you're talking also about like like how we kind of all came together to do this again kind of like that okay um, yeah definitely this has changed my identity I've become a lot nicer person I've learned how to communicate better <laughs> and um, and not be so uh, uptight and anxious. You have all taught me that, thank you. And um, I think me and Christian, 
when we were developing this together, we were um, we were in a Starbucks when we were do kind of pitching this to other people, and it came out of um, our both of our deep passions for film, and also just being family too. And I think that it, star it starts from that, and then it kind of kept growing out of my. I had this. I, had a, I was obsessed with like these like th these films. I had like a spreadsheet of films that I wanted to see. And I was just like, oh my God, I have to see these. And then I had a, um, a, a boyfriend at the time who was who told me you should do a screening. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. And then it just kind of wrapped, and I wrapped everyone into it, and it kind of became this moment. Um, and so for me, and also, it's all, and I think I've, I've told this story a couple of times, where it was just like, um, I have my really good friend Taylor, and I've always wanted to give her this like experience of not being alone through the publication of like of this kind of black art publication and because i know she was like out in ohio and she was like she was sad and I, I was like oh here's some like really cool thing that i'm working on and i wanted to share that with her and so for me it was deeply about investing myself into a black creative culture and creating those friendships and building and i have to keep reminding myself that is the place that it comes from um and so yeah and i would say that with everybody please do that start from that you know like start from that place um, and so because you'll actually retain all those those friendships and those connections and you'll want to like reply to those emails and you'll want to keep connecting with those people like oh I forgot I haven't hit them up in a month you know what are they working on because I, I think this project is deeply about like really artist oriented and I want us to keep that 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 kind of nugget with us um, so yeah Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, in the introduction, it was mentioned that you guys work on gentrification in Oakland, and I was wondering what you guys exactly do about that, because I was in Oakland not too long ago, and it was something that like I found really concerning, because it, it just wasn't, like, it just seemed very, like, techy and, like, not the Oakland that, you know, most people seem to talk about with the culture, especially, like, the downtown portion of it it seemed very different and kind of like, like it lacked a lot of culture because of all the gentrification that occurred. And I understand that you guys support, um, you know, local artists and that's a way to like, you know, battle against gentrification. But what about the like housing and like, are you guys doing anything about that? And if so, I'd love to know how you guys, you know, are facing it and working against it. We're, we're surviving. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying, I mean, I, we didn't, first of all, we didn't write the, the part about gentrification. I believe, y did you, you? Uh, yeah, it was the professors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> the way in which culture is changing in Oakland as a result of gentrification was something that, uh, seem to play a, a big role in your project and the ways in which you were trying to bring it's black like cult or maintain black it's culture. about uh, it's a question of space right yeah. like that's the i mean we don't okay i'm be real like we yeah. are we're not we can't help with the housing crisis like we can't do that but i think what this project comes out uh, the project came out of this idea like we don't have the money to have even have a space and a home base right so that's a problem that, that's a structural problem in certain ways that like certain artists can't, you know, can't even come together. There's not cheap spaces, not cheap studio spaces in order for artists to do this. So like on that side, we, I think this product, this project is very nomadic in that sense. So like, I think, and we respond, I mean, in ways we, in which we respond to that gentrification, I think is through like, through, like it's very much through like the fact that we can't have a space. We keep moving. We're trying to highlight spaces and the, through this kind of preservation of all these different black-owned spaces or different like art spaces that are, that care about us enough to have to have us and house us and host us. So I think when it comes to those kind of questions, I think we're we're still we're still trying to engage with that. But I think it's um, we cannot alone kind of come up with a strategy and an answer to that. Um, and I think there's a there's an article in which we're kind of, you know, we're trying to figure out. There's a lot, like there's Alina Museum, there's uh, Matatu, there's us, like, you know, and the Spirit House, right? Matatu, that's like uh, Michael Orange, he's like doing, he's placing himself across, kind of like, you know, 
um, we're kind of using a little bit of his model in a lot of ways, right? Oakland International Film Festival too. It's like, we're just like, I think we're all trying to like, like Layla said, survive in this. And I think there needs to be a lot more, it's like, what does it, I think the question would be more is like, okay, how would like the city want to deal with these things? Like, um, and how is the city, like the arts and cultural planning um, gonna develop and like, you know, us coming together and kind of speaking to that. Um. And it's also a question of, of you know, money. <laughs> it's not just space, it's also money. We, we fund this project out of our pockets most of the time to, to pay contributors, to pay filmmakers. And I think, you know, the, one of the ways that we are trying to combat it and trying to learn how to combat it is finding funding. And we did the article in the East Bay Express basically trying to detail ways in which we need help. And like putting that in a pub, like giving that a public presence, saying we need help. We're giving, we're providing this like cultural platform for people to consume, but it's, it's literally consuming our pockets. So I think just sharing that vulnerability with the public is something that's really important. And that's one of the ways that I think that we can combat it. It's just being real. We don't have money. We need money. <laughs> <laughs> We need space. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, all three of you. Um, I'm curious about the structure of a collective in relationship to individual practices and artistic practices. I'm very familiar with Layla's practice, and I'm just curious about, I love this like rhizomatic <laughs> thing that you guys kind of mutate into different forms. Um, and then also this way of, um, of collectively thinking together i was just curious about the structure of that like how does that happen how are choices made the distribution of labor thank you for that question um yeah um and i i i, I yeah i think rhizomatic is a good word for it i think that one of the things is that we are we're we're constantly working together. It's it's a constant. We're always like meeting and and trying to figure out what the next steps are going to be, what the next theme will be for the publication, um, what the next screening we want to to do is. But I think we had a setup where we were doing more of a eight week film screening, but we're now even more so looking to do projects that fit the desires of those that are in the group. So we did a screening at, we got, we also get asked to do certain things. So there's always a process of us communicating about what projects we want to take on and which ones that we don't think fit, feel fit us as a collective. Um, so there's that, but I think there's also, there's always room for, for change within the group. And there's also always a kind of, uh, we, we also have like our own projects that we'll work on, but we're always coming back to center to find out if that is something that we want to do as a group, something that represents the black aesthetic, something that works for us, so, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the questions that we all pose in our separate presentations, we're all, we're all individuals. We all have separate ways of thinking about what a black aesthetic is and what the black aesthetic as a collective is. Uh, and I think that that, you know, we don't, it's funny because you said it in your, in your, in the beginning of your presentation, like you think that having some unified front is kind of false. It's like, you know, I don't, it's it just it just so happens that because we're in close proximity to each other because we're sharing ideas and because we're having these conversations that we're all interrogating the same things and so those manifest in different ways and i think that's what's beautiful about all of us is the fact that we think about it differently and that we we work we like detangle blackness in different ways and i think that it potentially enriches all of our practices. Yeah. Like the conversations that we're able to have with, with each other about aesthetics, um, 
the expansion for me of my own like writing practice and my own creative writing that the black aesthetic has allowed the questions it's allowed me to think through without having some of the strictures that UC Berkeley puts on my writing etc um, has been extremely useful for me I know so, yeah. in regards to connecting with I'm bringing the black community together how big is has homophobia among black people been a big issue somewhat in like connecting certain members of the black community and getting them to your events has that ever been a barrier for specifically getting a big number of black I people? don't really think so No, but I think, I I mean, think this I have is not, one of the the, yeah. the, the things yeah. that's come up in conversation with us is that it, it just all it just so happens that we're all gay. Like every <laughs> like, like you know, like everybody's queer. So it's it's um but I it, yeah, so it's yeah, but I don't think that necessarily homophobia has I, I, I not in way not in ways that I can point to. Yeah. Yeah. I was like I haven't I haven't seen nobody giving me no problematic bullshit on that. I'm sorry. It, like we just haven't we just haven't had that like it just hasn't like um i think we the people that come there kind of they know what we are about a little bit but like not in the sense of like like it's just like yeah it just doesn't come up i don't th yeah we're just, i don't think we're explicitly queer in in some senses but it's just like we're we're very like all right we're here I think, I think we're as queer as blackness is queer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so there we go. I think that go. is I think that is how I th I think of the black aesthetic. It thinks of, of blackness in a very expansive way. Yeah. So yeah. Can can I ask a question about the presentations? Is that Yeah. Okay. Um I had a question about particularly I think in the last two pieces around um, the voice is a particular kind of materiality that informs certain spaces or move through certain spaces, even in, your, in the last piece. Um, the idea that the voice is holding a particular kind of historical knowledge that is oftentimes just like, it's heavy to move through. And so there was a choice to use a different voice, right, a recorded voice. And so I wanted to think, I, I'm really interested in that and I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, thinking in particular about the space, like the choices to use your voice in a certain way to talk about specifically about the voice also and the sound of a voice and just wanting to hear your thoughts about that, if you had any. Um, I'm just tired of being, I mean, I randomly, I'm just tired of being at readings and then like me being the only, sometimes being the only black person there. And I'm just like, how do I disembody that? Because I think just abstracting blackness and kind of, I think that definitely ties into Layla's I concepts and her presentation a lot, because it's like this overveloping, like how do I kind of like, because I love, I love when she talks about like in the theater space, how it is literally through darkness that something kind of becomes, you know, visualized. And so I, I really kind of like that idea of the Im that, that form of immaterialness of blackness and how it's kind of pervasive over all of these things. So I was like, I got tired of like, doing it and I was like as a I guess as an artist or a performer you just try to figure out different strategies to play with that and um yeah and like how do you speak to that how do I use my language how do I make what I do make that make that come across better um so that people actually listen because I feel like sometimes the issue with black folks is like y'all People want to listen to people. It's just like it's like a, the spectacle of listening to us, our pain, and then our joys, and then but at the same time not letting that like hit you, right? And I feel like there's this difference. Like I feel like there's a difference between like yes, we kind of intellectualize and understand everything, but at the heart level, are we kind of like re really kind of letting that hit us? And I'm always trying to figure out different ways of like working around that or through that. And I felt like in this instance, my voice was not necessary in that. Um, but yeah, and I, I was I, now I am deeply inspired by your presentation through that in a lot of ways and how in your discussions around that. Um, um, I mean, a lot of my personal work is video and usually sound isn't a part of it. So whenever I'm like doing presentations, I, I like to deconstruct image and sound in this performative way, because I think the voice and, and the sound of someone's voice can be used as a control mechanism. And so when I'm in like 
predominantly white spaces, I like to use my voice as a way to lead you to think, you know, lead you to certain thoughts. Um, and it's it's kind of like filmmaking in the sense that I can control the pacing, I can control the, the ways and the time that you uh, consume the images and consume my voice. So yeah, it's just the voice as control mechanism and how, how can I use my blackness and my embodied voice as a way to control the audience. Also, I just love the girls. I just like I have to, I have to do like the that that video was so amazing. That's fem, feminine destruction. Like you should just check her out. And like it's amazing. Like she's she has like there's just something about her movements that I'm like obsessed with and like how she vogues and just seeing yeah, she just has this different energy and then the song Hazekia you going to die. Like that's like a classic like a classic like kind of hymnal cycling. That's like a that's like such a great deep traditional gospel song. And also it's like this intersection of like for me what voguing is and the church and like the movements of a revival and like of possession, right? And so be in like that joy, right? And how both of these different spaces we what we think don't intersect are deeply intertwined in a lot of ways. And I think in a lot of ways, Vogue is reviving gospel, and gospel is one of the last vanguards, I think, of like black cultural production, which we don't actually think about often, because they're keeping a lot of our traditions alive, that cr in current contemporary music, like that's those scissors and the Solanges and the whatever, they're doing something, but they're like not, I think there's, they're, keep, they're pushing in a different way, but I want us to also just think about like, there's something like, don't forget where that all kind of comes from, right? Like I think, don't forget like gospel and blues and all that stuff. Like that's deeply intertwined and enriching. All right, that's my little two cents. Um, hi. Um, so you've mentioned screenings a few times, or you screening, um, and maybe my question is a little bit obvious, but I'd be interested in um, why film. Um, what is it about the medium of film that you guys find interesting, and what is it about screening? and coming together and does the, um, the experience and the audience factor into it as well? <laughs> do, you go, do you go to a lot of movies? Okay. Um, I mean, I, I like to, I don't, I don't go to them as much as I would like to just because you know, busy, but um, when I do go to them, the theaters are, aren't as black as I want them to be. How many times, or how often can you, have you sat in, an, in a theater in a dark space with m predominantly black bodies? Black have you ever? Probably not. So that, I mean, that's why I film. I wanna sit in darkness with everybody and like, feel our bodies and, and feel our bodies react to images. There's something really powerful about that. Yeah, it's like mass, right? Yeah. Mass. Like church. Mm, yeah. Except in darkness. Yeah. So like. Um, and I, yeah, it was really interesting to think about like what drew me to the black aesthetic. And I remember being in indie film spaces when I was younger and sitting there and being like surrounded by older white people who paid me absolutely no attention in the type of like alienation that can cause um, and to be able to ex to be able to have that experience with those who are like-minded and like you and have similar ex share similar experiences is is, um, is something that I really came to appreciate uh, through the black aesthetic. So I think that, that that's definitely part of it. Yeah. In, the, in the second publication, the, my piece was inspired by this uh, incident I had. Um, I went to the Roxy in San Francisco and they were screening Sun Ra's Space is the Place. And man, seeing that on a large screen, you, you have to see it like projected, but you know, it's such a black film. It's such a black film. And so when the lights came on at the end of the film and I was the only black person in the theater, I mean, I wanted to, I almost wanted to cry. 
Because, like, why weren't there more black people in that audience? You know, what is it that's keeping us out of these these intimate spaces, out of these uh, spaces where we consume our own culture together? I was, yeah, that is still haunting to me that I can go to one of the blackest films ever made and there are no black people. So um, can you talk a little bit about the publication that uh, more and uh, where we could uh, get hold of it to read it, how we find so, it? So, yes. Um, Second Season's publication, done by Zoe Samudzi, the undeniably talented, amazing, and brilliant. And she's actually having a talk on Saturday, actually, with uh, Ed Natiri, who also has photos in the Second Season's publication. Um, actually, you can check us out. You can order the books online, but there's some at the bookstore. Um, we have, it's surprising, you guys have six copies of the First Season's book, actually. That's the only six copies left. Oh, yep, there it is, right there. They're sold um, out everywhere else, so y'all Yeah, might. so this is the only place, and then we have some copies of the second season's book, so please check us out there. And um, yeah, like, we got, actually so funny, um, one of the contributors is actually on the wall um, for like the Way Bay writing thing, like Ishmael is on, over there, he's contributed. Um, we have Shaw, and then La Luqueza, who also we did screenings with at Nook Gallery. She's an amazing artist too. And yeah, anything else I should add? Well, right. yeah, I mean, Malika also contributed and interviews. Oh yeah, there's like interviews, like um, Yotunde Olagbaju's work, which she was here for Feels last night. She showed some video work. Um, let's see what else. Oh, Brantez, he has for the Way Bay, the Way Bay show, he has free jazz. That piece is actually here. Um, Berkeley bought that free jazz piece. And um, we screened one of his films, A Hundred Boyfriends Mixtape. Um, what else? I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for the presentations and the conversation. This has been really amazing. Thanks so much.